Hello, uh, welcome to the first episode of the Progressive MS uh, webinar series. Um, and this first episode is being done in conjunction with obviously the MS Society who are supporting it. But Jonathan, Dr. Jonathan Egan is joining us today, who's a clinical psychologist. Hello, Robert. Now, what I wanted to let you know before we started is why we have decided to do this webinar series. So progressive MS in its two forms, primary progressive and secondary progressive, has huge implications on how you live your life and where you go and what happens in your life. And it can be really daunting and it can be very difficult to manage how you react to this illness. Now, I have multiple sclerosis myself. I have secondary progressive for, and I've been, was diagnosed 29 years ago. So that's the reason why I'm doing the, the, the hosting is that I have lived experience of this illness and I want to use that to help um, the people who are watching this webinar series. The theme of it is resilience. So we want to make you stronger. And I have found in my experience that the more information I have about what's going to happen to me and the tools and resources that are available to me makes me more resilient or stronger in the face of this particular illness. So the first thing I would like to do is uh, thank the MS Society. Thank you very much for uh, giving us this opportunity. And we've got Dr. Jonathan Egan with us. Dr. Uh, Egan is an academic and chartered health and clinical psychologist. He is also trained in both attachment and affect phobia therapies. His research has been in relation to trauma, its effect on a person's psychological well-being. His other clinical and research interests is how our own learned internal models of relationships, which we learned in childhood, can affect both progressive caregivers and in people who are diagnosed with chronic health conditions, and whether they can learn to improve their ability to seek help effectively without shame in order to receive effective care and be met as a person who is an expert by experience in their, whole, in their own health status and needs. So thank you very much, Jonathan. Welcome thank to you, Robert. this series. Looking forward to it. And certainly we are going to be building on uh, what we discussed in the previous webinar series that we had done back in August now. Wow. Um, which is, yeah, it's a while ago. So thank you very much. So Jonathan, um, let's start by defining what we think isolation is. Oh, wait a sec, actually. Okay. Before I do that, there was something that I wanted to do. Uh, Mary Melia, who is oh, yeah. a, uh, was on our last series, she is a poet and she's got multiple sclerosis herself. And she has a poem that uh, I thought would be particularly appropriate for this, to start up this series. Fantastic. It's called Being. Being to make a difference in a world to show you care, to conquer high, difficult mountains, life's obstacles through feeling scared. Being sad, strong, indifferent to progress, never been accused of one to care less. This world may not owe you a living, so make it count. If it does go wrong, confess. Being accepting, though feeling, is not fair. Why you? Why not you? Why me? Why not me? Life sells you a dream and you agree to share with other amazing individuals not charging a fee. Being here, having been, being, being. So that's a nice start for uh, this. So Jonathan, can you just explain to me really what isolation is from a psychological point of view? I suppose it's down to um, our perception of it. Uh, do uh, do we feel isolated or do i do i sense that i'm isolated um i might be isolated if, if, if you look at the facts around me but internally i might have lovely relationships with dead uh, grandparents parents friends friends who know maybe thousands of miles away and my internal monologue or conversation with them can maintain me for a long time 
I could also be isolated if I'm in the middle of a room of 50 people I know well um, and you don't care about, but I'm holding back something from them uh, that I feel unequal to or to share with. Um, I may feel isolated if the world is there and there's shared interests or interests of my own, which I would love to be able to do. But because of my health condition, I've been held back from. And there could be a sense of isolated injustice there. That it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's um, We talk about the, un, the uninvited chair in therapy. That's a lot of people say the intellectual dis disability never get to see psychologists. But there might be an uninvited chair of life for some people when they're going through um, a progressive condition, which is worsening. Um, and then- So the, I'm, I'm sorry, yeah. what do you mean by this uninvited chairs? Um, it's, it's a bit like uh, you say, say you're, you're, you've um, a flare with your MS. Mm -hmm. And um, the plan was in that weekend in July, the family to get together, which everybody loves and really kind of nourishes and, and re-energizes people will, will occur. But unbeknownst to you, uh, you suddenly have a flare and everything you planned for. I think we live in the present moment. We also live in the future. So uh, we can be isolated in the present moment. We can also be isolated in the future because of our plans in the present. Um, so we can have many different times of, of isolation. The thing about isolation is that it triggers times and periods in the past when we were felt uh, rejected, denigrated, isolated, left out, abandoned. Um, and when people have chronic health conditions, particularly from a younger age, they've had to leave themselves out um, or were left out because of their condition. And whether they're immunosuppressed or whether the, the level of fatigue or, or pain or, or, just the, or, the, or the treatment they need to receive meant that they had to be excluded. And that's so, a horrible sense of uh, yeah. yeah I, 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 I'm just wondering about that because mm. there, there are, I see three different mm. phases. We've got, uh, yeah. before we were diagnosed, okay? Yeah. So we have our personal yeah. way of being. Um, yeah. And then suddenly we have been diagnosed with this chronic condition. Yeah. Uh, if it's primary progressive, it is from the very start and you're gradually getting worse. Yeah. Um, is, the, is there a kind of a personality type associated with feeling isolation in a negative sense? So I know myself, I, I'm happy with my own company. Yeah. Yeah. I like to do my own things. Mm -hmm. um, Though I have felt, particularly when I was initially diagnosed, that I was separate from the world. Yeah. Okay. And actually, speaking of that, um, if any of the people who are listening want to ask a question of Jonathan, yeah. please feel free to put into the uh, question and answer at the bottom of the uh, screen. Uh, and we'll, if we can, ask the questions of Jonathan as we progress through this. Yeah. So, Jonathan, going back to that, is there a, a certain people who are more impacted by this isolation? Well, I think if you're um, an extrovert and you are then, and you gain your energy, your vitality increases by interacting with others. And if you're MS or what's happened in relation to this, even COVID and MS together compounding, mm -hmm. that can affect you where, you where you draw your energy from. And that can affect your sense of self. I'm not myself anymore. I'm not able to be myself this situation is holding me back from myself. Introverts tend to gain their energy more from going internally. Now you'll find it difficult to tell the difference between uh, Robert and I, um, if we're both talking about something we really care about or are interested in, we both will appear like extroverts. We'll be excited, our energy, our vitality will go up. But um, introverts tend to, if there's a party down the, the, the hallway, will tend to go, oh, for goodness sake, that noise there, and will, will, that will detract from their energy. An extrovert will go, I wonder what's happening down there. I wonder if I know some people there. Maybe if I walk by and I catch somebody there, they might invite me in. And there's an increase and a drawing towards uh, energy. So there's that kind of personality factor. The second personality factor, if you look at it, is kind of uh, neuroticism. Um, and it's people, and we're different in that. You don't tend to cat catastrophize, whereas I do, Robert. Um, if I get a, a funny looking mole on my hand, I'm convinced within five minutes I've, that I'm going to die within a, in a month. And lucky I'm married to a GP who would just <laughs> look at me and go, no, it's not. It's, and explain the ridges are fine and the color is fine. So that's the second type, is a person who reacts in a catastrophic way to some information and immediately jumps from 2 plus 2 to 25, not 2 plus 2 equals 4. 
the people who aren't neurotic might go two plus two, maybe it equals five. I'm not sure because I'm not really sure about the facts here. Mm -hmm. um, so that's hugely important with MS and any word I can hard, find hard to say, trajectory in any illness mm -hmm. is what information are you given at the time? Does the person wash the dishes as they go? And when they sit, your, your, your GP or your primary consultant, do they say, oh, look, at, it's unlikely that's to do with you, Robert, because of your age profile, because of this, yeah. this, and this. Um, and, and to notice when the person's anxious and go, Is there, are there any more questions there, Robert? Now, because I notice you have a funny look in your face. Come on, to ask any silly questions you want to. They're the best kind of people for us to meet um, with my personality type. Um, and then there's another type of person who's, is, um, if you're more anxious, and if you haven't had a mother and father or a teacher who's calmed you, you might go on to have a, what's called an anxious attachment style. And these are people who are, will go to a GP or go to the consultant and ask the questions and their anxiety will only be um, ameliorated for, for a few days. But then suddenly it peaks again because they'll have these ruminative thoughts which will go around in their head and they'll have so, to go back again. So I, I find that that's... Um the fact that there are different personality types yeah. and that that people tend to if they're an anxious type if if i'm listening to you correctly yeah. that that anxiety in a way only allows them to remove that isolation for a short period of time yeah okay exactly. yeah so if, if that is the type of person that you are and you've got a chronic illness that is going mm -hmm. to be getting worse and worse and worse yeah. and worse yeah. right um, how do you overcome that uh, kind of yeah. catastrophization exactly, that, yeah. that you're yeah. talking yeah. about? So, for example, with me, with COVID, um, initially when, I, when the COVID-19 occurred, I was checking 20 times a day, looking at mm -hmm. BBC, RT, uh, going over to the States to see what they knew, looking at in Padua and Italy and knew, see what those researchers knew. And it, and it made me more and more anxious. So in the meantime, what I've done is I will look at the nine o'clock news and I will look to nature. There are the two places, which is a journal, a science journal, the top journal in the world. I look at those two sources now because they're the best sources, which are the most reliable and less anxiety provoking for me. And um, so it's, it's a bit like when I'm look, looking at um, a lot of the MS blogs, not blogs, the MS information sites. I could feel my heart, even though I don't, don't have MS myself, I could feel my heart getting very excited. There's a cure, a cure here for it. And I'd be looking at it and go, oh my God, and this is great. And, and, and then I go, well, then actually, if you read through the details, no. And, and then if I checked up the scientific site, no, no, this is just preliminary data. There's no way this is going to be, it's unlikely to in the next 10 years. And that's the kind of thing which can really excite your threat system, your excitement system, but it's also your threat system. And, and it, the idea of, is there hope there? Some people with their isolation, they withdraw from people, but also they don't allow themselves to get hope or excitement anymore because it's too painful to, to wish that I'll be, what I call it, it's the compartmentalization of the me pre-MS and the me post-MS. That there's two parts of the self that don't like each other very much. So you, we're, we're, what you're saying is that we have to somehow mar marry these two things yeah. together. Yeah. The, the pre-MS where yeah. you, were, you were fine and yeah. great, and now you've got this illness which is slowing you down. And of course, yeah. when you have a progressive form of MS, there are other things acting yeah. like um, cognitive problems that can actually make it worse. And we discussed yeah. this before, yeah. the, the impact of the symptoms of MS yeah. on your ability to... Uh, deal with these issues so so for example you're you're saying there that uh and this was earlier what you were saying that if there was a party down the corridor and you've got the extrovert will, will want to go there the introvert will be annoyed about the sound but the extrovert if you got uh your ms and your mobility is gone yeah. or your ability to tolerate sound Fair, or yeah. crowds is gone but you have this inbuilt built yeah. need yeah. Yeah. to go to this party yeah um suddenly your 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 illness is holding you away yeah but you're psycho psychologically you need to be at that party so yeah. how do you exactly so it's it's um well first of all if we don't find some way to access it we're gonna, our sense of self will be to be depleted 
Um, if, if whenever we feel hostage to that we can't escape a situation, it causes huge immunosuppression. So it won't be good for your MS in the long run as well. It causes increased inflammation in the body, inflammation in the brain, and will amplify any parts of MS that are there, the confusion, the memory loss, the concentration, all those things will be amplified, as well as the numbness, paresthesias, tingling in the arms and body and that. Mm -hmm. But so that we have to, in some way, try and facilitate ourselves to get what we need whether that's social connection whether it's so often like we found it so good you and i connecting here on the previous 30 uh, 30 minute life um uh, blog and uh, webcast um and other people who were there what happened was we all our energies lifted our vitality lifted and it didn't we didn't have to travel anywhere we didn't have to go anywhere so how do I, it's a bit like when you work with somebody who was at, um, avant, is that the word? Uh, a swimmer. And um, when their MS suddenly impairs in their ability to do the breaststroke or something. Mm -hmm. And when I'm talking with somebody in a therapy room, I would say, well, you know, if you can never swim again, but you, you still call yourself a swimmer, what can you do? And then they go, well, actually, I did find with the physio training session when I was walking up and down the water, um, so there was no, no weight in my body and that facilitated the walking that I actually enjoyed that sensation and I was still in the pool and I'm still a swimmer, but I wasn't swimming in that way. Do you know the way? So it's about how do you, it's a bit like a, a famous rugby player when they retire, they have to manage the new self and old self. So mm -hmm. a lot of them go into coaching. So they're still in the area which gives them vitality and joy, but it's different. It's, it's, a, it's a bit like being a grandparent, you're not rather than directly parenting a child. There's a, there's, a, there's a bit of a remove, but it's how you handle yourself and that. Are you gentle to yourself? Are you kind to yourself? Or do you get into this comparing my old self and my new self, which, which is going to be like a game of vicious tennis? That's, that's very true. Now, can, there's something that I was just wondering, that one person has asked, yeah. would it, is it possible to change your background, Jonathan? Oh, is it possible to change my background? Yeah, because uh, so Will you the... keep talking and I'll... I'll um... Yeah. So... Yeah. What I was interested in, in what you're saying there about trying to find this place you were talking about where you feel comfort or you have your, uh, you say once you were the rugby player is what yeah. you were saying. And now you become a, a trainer or a coach. Okay. Yeah. If you, and this is the problem with the, the progressive nature of this is that a lot of people define who they are by their work, by their work. or they d define it by the family that they're part of. Uh -huh. And when this illness takes hold of you and you're in the early stages of it, you're, you have lost those Ooh. things that will uh, give you that vitality. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And what, what I find really difficult is once you have lost those things that defined you for most of your life or even your young life, yeah. you've lost that. And somehow it, say you were an accountant and you're not able to be an accountant anymore. I think that's probably a better background. Yeah. yeah. Um, the, and you can't do that activity anymore. Finding something that will uh, replace yeah. that yeah. to give you the vitality. Yeah. Is there something that the person can do to, help them find what that is yeah well before so when we get stressed adrenaline occurs and cortisol and all the stress hormones are occur and what we tend to do is approach um any difficulty we have in our lives with black or white thinking all or nothing thinking if i can't be in a, do, do be the full accountant i'm going to never be an accountant again and we know from you being the expert by experience it's, it's not all that way but it does mean that you're, if you're talking to somebody who can explore with you, okay, you were an accountant, but you think that you can never be an accountant again or, or something, that if you approach life instead of a full day of accountancy into a 30-minute breaks of being an accountant mm -hmm. or being a, being a different variant of in how you can manage your energy levels, that can be quite a different conversation for a person to have how to pace yourself. Now, if you're a type A personality who's gung-ho, uh, runs forward, doesn't ever stop and gets, has low frustration tolerance, that's going to be very, very difficult for you. If you're more phlegmatic, more laid back, more sanguine, um, th that won't be so difficult, the, the idea of, of pacing. In fact, the people who are more um, 
drop the tools, are, they often need to upregulate instead of uh, to, to go into a, um, you know, to, to actually go into movement rather than relaxation to um, when they get their MS, not to take to the bed quite as much, but to explore and see, is this anxiety? Is this MS? Are these the symptoms? What happens if I do that instead of going into kind of a collapsed kind of place? So it does depend on the personality, but it also on our thinking style. Because um, we do, when we're stressed, tend to go all or nothing. My life is over. I will never be myself again. You know, and that's, you know, it, it, um, we all get there, but it's about either who can help us stand up again or how can we say to ourselves, maybe it's, maybe it's not fully over. Maybe if we approach it differently. Um, maybe you could tell us some, me about your, your own pacing, uh, Robert. Yeah, and this is something that I've really had to learn. Pacing is, has been a huge challenge for me. Um, and, but I have learned over the last, well, let's say, six or seven years how to change how I do my activities. So I once used to like to do it all in one big lump, and I just can't do that anymore. Mm. So, and this is why I called my blog a 30 minute life, because I know my limit is 30 minutes. And if I go over that, so for example, this particular series that we're doing is 45 minutes long. That is a struggle for me. Um, and I know that once I'm completed with this, I'm going to pay for this 45 minutes. But that's okay. I, I've accepted that as an acceptable cost to me to do this. But also from that pacing point of view, I once was able to do something in a day, and now it takes me four days or five days to do it because I have to spread it out over the number of days. But I find that incredibly frustrating at times because I'm not that person that I once was. Mm. I've lost who I was before. Yeah. So I find that hugely challenging. And I think that anybody with MS, that is one of the things that they have to uh, get over. And in fact, I remember when I was first diagnosed, one of the things that I didn't do is I didn't tell my work colleagues that I had MS. Wow. I told the management, but I didn't tell my work colleagues. Mm. And I was kind of hiding from them my, my weaknesses, I felt. Okay. And I found that really isolating because I was going through something and nobody else could see it. And also I found in my friends and, uh, that I was talking to that they didn't know how to talk to me about my illness and I didn't know how to talk to them about it. Oh. And again, I was isolated. And that was really extremely challenging. And I had no help at the time to figure that out. Yeah. And I went through those dark days um, at that time. And what I'm hoping that you might be able to share with us mm. some tools, certainly in that early phase, how you can overcome that. And then going on, maybe even into relationships with, mm -hmm. say, you have a partner. Yeah. Again, you feel like you're separate from them because they don't really understand what you're going through physically. Yeah. Yeah. And we have to be very gentle to ourselves because when we have a chronic condition and if we've, through our own best knowledge, uh, gone into withdrawal or avoidance or self-isolation, um, we can end up shutting off parts of the brain unbeknownst to ourselves. So we can end up going into what's called a depersonalized, derealized space where we feel a bit numb. We don't have the same access to the feelings we had before. Um, we, we're still able to contact or be in, t in contact with our cognition. So I've, I've worked with lawyers, judges, different people who've um, been able to do the work very effectively and, and remain um, as cognate, as, as been able to think and talk to other people, but their feeling is gone. And when yeah. the feeling disappears, also your, your sense of value and meaning of yourself goes as well, which is, and people feel robotic. They feel like an automaton. They feel like um, that they don't have worth. And the problem then is, if I don't have worth, ergo, do, uh, am I worthwhile? If I'm in a relationship, am I a burden then? If I'm a burden, I might as well withdraw and not be a burden to people. And not for, if I don't like myself, why would I expect other people to like myself? Therefore, be better off if it wasn't around. And I felt that. Yeah. Right. And that is, that is a really hard place to be because mm -hmm. 
you, you have lost who you are. Yeah. yeah. And you, uh, what I found very difficult was how to get myself out of that hole mm. that you're in where you have no, uh, no visibility of how you're going to get out of it. And so it's very dark. And one that somebody's just asked a question there. Uh, they've asked, uh, how do I pay after that 30 minutes? Yeah. And the actual, what happens is I have chronic headaches. Uh, mm. They call them persistent post-traumatic headaches. And my headache will go from its level of about a five out of 10. And I'll hit about a seven maybe, or an eight this after this is over. Okay. And I'll end up having to go to bed and I'll mm. probably be in bed for the rest of the afternoon after this. That's okay. my cost. It's acceptable to me for this. Mm -hmm. um, but when you're in that dark space, Jonathan, mm -hmm. and you feel all alone, yeah. you cannot get in touch with your partner. Yeah. For some reason, you can't communicate with them or you cannot communicate with your friends or your family mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. how you're feeling at this time what do you do how do you leap out of that yeah well yeah so it's, it's first of all we have to be gentle to ourselves that if we're in a shut down immobilized place that's a very biological and physical place to go if we have ms it's going to be amplified okay um so some people have are very poor in the mornings it'll be very hard to initiate and get to yourself going with ms or a chronic pain or chronic pain and ms and headaches it's going to make it even more difficult so you have to try and facilitate yourself that that so that first okay what do i need is the big question okay remember if mm -hmm. when we're shut down we've we've basically gotten to a shutdown place from denying our own needs I need to have contact with other people, my family and friends. I need to be included with my family and friends. So that's part of what our needs are, are the answer to the opposite place of shutdown. How do I get a shutdown? The first thing is, is having a, a, a routine that activates us. Um, the, the routine that they've literally from the very start, I've worked with one person recently, had a horrible kind of um, my, ME presentation. And I, I said to him, Okay, in the morning, I want you to get the three lo uh, loudest alarm clocks you have and to put them in the kitchen, on the corridor, and, in, and far away in your bedroom. And A, don't look at them during the night to see the time because it doesn't help at all. Um, but when they go off, it'll frighten you and you have to get up and, and turn them off. So th there's almost like when people become immobilized, and it happens in war situations when someone's shot or they've got shell shock, you have to go and shake your your uh, comp your your comrade into action to get them moving again. Mm -hmm. It's like a little rabbit or a dog who goes into the freeze response. You have to almost push them um, to get them going again. So there's something about getting ourselves into in, into um, movement again, which is hugely important. That's why if we become deconditioned, it's a really dangerous place to get. Um, so a little movement, it might be having a shower and brush my teeth Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday is the key to get, getting me movement, moving. And maybe you, you, because whatever's happened, maybe you find it hard to brush your teeth. So maybe do it in the shower when it's warm and you're able to move. It's all about figuring out what's the best way I can have a win-win situation, particularly in the most difficult parts of the day. That's the first part of activation. Okay. And uh, one of the things that you were talking about, earlier was this how you feel uh the world fe might feel a little bit unreal or yeah, you yeah. feel disconnected yeah. and actually we have a poll that we wanted to oh, wow. see if anybody feels this way so uh Aoife, uh if you could pop up question wow. uh we have a few questions thanks very much uh we can run down through these questions actually so if Everybody, if you could take a, a, a moment to answer some of these questions, because we wanted to find out basically what type of people are going to be, are, are actually attending this webinar. But we also, so if you can answer whether you're primary progressive, secondary progressive, where do you live, um, what age bracket you're in. Uh, but question four is a question that we'd really like to see what your responses are. And the question is, do you experience times when the world feels unreal or you feel disconnected with your body? So it'll be very interesting to hear yeah. if the people who are listening to this actually respond to that. So we leave that poll open for wow, uh, a terrific. few minutes uh, while, we're, while we're chatting here. 
And in, in a way that that question could lead a, a thread right throughout your talks, because you'll have people talking about nutrition, I think, yeah. you know, about people pacing and um, the occupational therapy and that. But part of it, this is a hardwired response we're talking about here. This is a, a hardwired biological response, which is related to a thing called cortisol um, and infl inflammatory processes in the brain and the body. So if you get a little puppy who's really happy and playful, and if you get a vial of inflammatories and you tap it and you get the syringe ready and you, you put those inflammatories into the puppy's brain, the puppy will become withdrawn and will be anhedonic, will not enjoy the activities it used to enjoy. And so we have to manage our inflammation and, and how we manage our stress when we get into this shutdown place. Shutdown and mobilization is related to massive levels of cortisol. Mornings are when humans have the highest levels of cortisol. So are you saying then that uh, the morning would be a bad time to try and pull yourself out of this? Well, it's, it's the time where you, when if you don't get moving, it, you know what I mean? You might get stuck there for the rest of the day. I, and, but that's for one particular type of person, you say that? Yeah, yeah. Or is that, is that really an MS thing it's, where... Well, it's, 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 it's everybody, be... yeah, but MS it could be even higher, you know, because, you know, if you start off, if the day's going to be difficult, and if you think to yourself, okay, how, how's my day going to go? Um, unless you get moving, you might be able to entertain any other thoughts than I just stay here. It's going to be a bad day. And one of the things that uh, for me, I've mm. accepted yeah. is when I have a bad day, yeah. Yeah. Um, I accept that I'm having a bad day. Okay. I'm I just say, a, that's it. A bad day. Yeah. Okay. This is a bad day. Bad day. I'm yeah. just going to lie in my bed. I'm going to feel horrible mm -hmm. for the day and maybe okay. even two days. Yeah. But that's acceptable. Right. Yeah. That's different. Yeah. And I don't try and beat myself up about no. those days, no. but that's taken me years to come to that yeah. Uh, yeah. ability to do that. Yeah. Is there anything that people can do to maybe rationalize for themselves when they're having that bad time? Yeah, you see, I suppose that this is where, and people don't like doing this, this is where people need to diary so they know that there's, there's certain times during the month, if you're a woman, or um, there's different, uh, there's, you know, certain times of year where, where you're affected, or, or after certain activities, or if you've overdone it, if you haven't paced yourself. So it's, it's about knowing yourself and how your energy levels, your vitality levels get affected by previous activities and by times of day. There are people who are naturally with their circadian rhythms, how they're, they're regulated. Some people are, I'm a night owl and I, I, I can write in an academic paper at two in the morning. My wife is, is a morning lark and she gets up at 5.30 in the morning when, once it gets bright, whereas I'd rather stay until 10 past eight. And so you have to look at that side as well. It's a bit like with teen, if you're a teenager with MS, teenagers need a lot more sleep. Mm -hmm. A lot more sleep. You're talking about often 12 hours, you know, and, and, even, and not to really get yourself going until the middle of the morning. So are, are we reverting back to our teenage life? Because we have so much of us have fatigue. fatigue. It's like being a teenager again. Yeah, um, well, it's, it's um, well, I suppose how you manage fatigue is hugely important, isn't it? Uh, it it's, yeah, I, fatigue is, a, is an issue for mm. so many people with progressive MS. And yeah. it is de really debilitating. Yeah, yeah. And you just cannot do anything. No, and no, I, I know... My mobility gets worse when I'm tired. Yeah. My ability to understand what people mm. are saying to me really. Yes. Yeah. And I found that that, that's fascinating. Yeah. That cognitive yeah. overload. Yeah. When I'm fatigued, yeah. somebody could say something to me and I won't remember what they said two minutes mm. ago. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And the impact of that on my way of living is that I avoid those situations yeah now the danger is is i will avoid all times yeah interacting with other people because yeah. i'm afraid of that yeah how do you learn what the that balance is yeah so the the biggest maintainer of going into the bad place is avoidance okay so it's about having that difficult conversation with yourself is saying okay is, is that avoidance something I, will it be good for me in the long run, this type of avoidance? Whilst also being very kind to yourself, saying, look, at sometimes I'm going to have a flare, I'm going to have a really bad day, and I'll need to avoid. But then to stop ourselves going to, into self-shaming, 
we need to say, okay, what do I tell people? What script will I use to inform myself and others that I'm having a bad day? It's not going to happen. And not to add to the Irish thing of what's called undoing of adding on to, after my assertion, adding on, I hope you're okay with that. Okay. Do you know what I mean? The, the, yeah. where you go back and go, I'm sorry, I was really narc with you yesterday. No, no, don't, don't shame yourself and go around apologizing all the time. You know? But see, does that not just, uh, can we close that poll then, uh, Aoife, just because I'm, I'm curious to see what the answers no, are. I hear what the answers are. Yeah. yeah. Um, the, okay, let's see if we go through these, some answers. Uh, primary progressive and secondary, pro more or less 50 yeah. 50 there between the two. Uh, but it's nice to see that there are other people who are attending this that uh, don't have progressive MS. Uh, locations, Leinster, uh, nobody from out of the country. I thought we might have one or two people from outside of Ireland. Um, ages, mainly older. Uh, but that's true because progressive MS mainly affects yeah. the older population. Okay, yeah. so, uh, and I'm one of those. Uh, now, this is the interesting question. Do you experience times when the world feels unreal or you feel disconnected with your body? Uh, daily, 24% uh, feel that daily. Wow. 17% uh, feel it weekly. Weekly. Um, monthly, 10%. 3% would feel it annually, maybe once a year, and 45% don't feel it at all. Okay. okay. 24, 30. You're talking about nearly 50% will be between monthly and daily, so it's a lot of people. It's, it's a lot of people, yeah. and yeah. so th that's a really big issue then for yeah. Yeah. looking at this mm -hmm. um, as a problem for people, yeah. and isolation then. Going, if uh, isolation is a problem, how often do people feel this? 38% don't feel it. Okay. Okay. But 14% feel this daily. Okay. Yeah. 21% yeah. feel it weekly. Yeah. And 24% feel it monthly. Yeah. And 60% of people think it's worse now oh. because of COVID. Wow. And, and you know, the, the health um, researchers would suggest that feeling isolated and lonely is equivalent to smoking 20 cigarettes a day. Oof. The biological the health implications of it. So because we're, we've had to isolate physically mm -hmm. because of COVID, yeah. okay, we're afraid that because of our MS, where our immune systems are susceptible, that yeah. COVID could have a bigger impact on us. Now, it's yeah. nice to see that the government has changed a little bit of its uh, vaccination thing oh, good. In, in the last couple of days. Brilliant. But the, the, this... Um, God, that th I hate this about MS. I lose my track. Okay. <laughs> you're in the middle of something and you're, you're flowing. Um, the, uh, what was I talking you're about? You're talking about now? the isolation. Oh, uh, yes. The, 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 isol the physical isolation that we have because of the, this um, illness and because of COVID. Yeah. That makes it very difficult for us to physically be in touch with other people. And that lack of physicality Mm. whether it is just that touch or that hug or whatever. Yeah. We've lost an awful lot in this equation. Uh, come on top of the other losses that we've had because of our illness. Yeah. How do we get that emotional link with people again without that physicality? Yeah. This is hugely important. And um, Part of, you know, this, this shutdown response is there's a, a nerve which we call the vagabond nerve. It's like the drunken nerve that meanders right through your body and goes through most of the, the bodily um, organs, the heart, your, your voice box, your lungs, down to your, your enteric system, your, your, your guts, down to your sexual reproductive organs, down to your, your anus. Um, and th this is called the, the vagus nerve. Um, and the very 4% the of the vagus nerve is up in your, your frontal neocortex, and it's the social part of the brain. So you can stimulate this vagus system and, and bring it back into in control, it, 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 calm your, your nerves and bring yourself back online, not shut down, not shut off, by connection with other people. But the first place to start is in the home. You might discover if you're in a, in a, having a flare or if you're, having a, you're in the shutdown space, that you're not making as much contact with your partner through the eyes. That people, it's easier to avoid the eyes. It's e easier to avoid the connection, the hold, like when you hold your dog's head and look right in the eyes or a baby. 
that part gets missing when we go into withdrawal. And one way we can really improve that is by connecting with somebody through the eyes, somebody who, somebody who understands us and gets us and doesn't blame us and doesn't make it worse. Um, that's the first thing we need to do. And that can be, on, that can be fine if, if you're on Zoom with somebody who cares about you, um, or because uh, otherwise therapists wouldn't work. Um, um, or, but I think at the home, and all, even to say, if, if it was me, I'd say to my, my wife, I'd go, look, tell me if I'm not really making eye contact with the kids or you. Because it might be a sign. I might be aware of myself of it, that I'm gone a bit shut down. And, and you know, c- c- say, come here, come here, look at me. You know, that way to, to activate this part of the brain, which is connected to this big vagabond nerve, which, which affects your inflammation process, affects how in contact you are with yourself and the world. But say, for example, that, that other person that's in your house, yeah, yeah. Um, they don't really understand your MS. Okay. Um, wow. How do you how, how do you um, overcome that? Because it, yeah. I think this is a real reality for yeah. so many people with chronic illnesses. Yeah. The partner in the house, yeah. whether it is you know, a husband or wife or parents or, mm. or children, because they're not actually they don't feel the illness the way yeah. we do. Yeah, their understanding of it, though they try, can be yeah can be limited yeah, yeah. and that, that creates a detachment. Yeah. And what happens is that the first time you say, oh, I'm feeling tired yeah. and, they say, yeah. and they say back to them, oh yeah, I felt tired yesterday yeah. and I yeah. just had an extra few hours sleep. Yeah. If you have a couple of those questions that the other person doesn't really yeah. understand what you're mm-hmm. feeling, mm-hmm. Um, how do you overcome that then? Yeah, and it's extraordinary. You won't get the answer from health professionals. <laughs> we ran lots of groups with people with severe chronic pain, severe migraine, which is kind of a neurological disorder as well. Mm-hmm. And um, after a few of these groups, they kind of, the people in the group said, we said, give us some feedback. What would you like more of? And they went, well, you've never, have you never thought about inviting our family here and our partners? And we went, oh, God, no, because you're the identified patient. You know, but no, if, if somebody's sick in the family, the whole family is sick. Um, and we have to teach them how to 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 talk about this um, thing that's affecting the well-being, the vitality of the whole family, affected one partner, but but how to communicate it. So we started then having um, partners and 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 for, or for, or a friend, identify friend, to come in, and we we'd give a session with them about how it was, and then and then join them together, because some of the stuff is too emotional initially mm-hmm. to have one partner go. Have you noticed you're not looking at each other in the eyes as much? That you're not lying on the couch giving the cuddle or that. And they could suddenly go, God, because when you're in that shut off place, you don't realize that you've done that. It's not a, you don't say, I'm going to shut down from you and, uh, and, and stonewall you. That's kind of more psych- psychopathological, isn't it? I think we get in a slippery slope and we remove ourselves because it's easier, but also because we're shut down. Now, I'm just going to go through, see if there's any other um, questions here, because we're actually getting very close to hmm? our 45 minutes. Oh my goodness. Uh, we have another by. three minutes left to go. So, uh, so be, be, people listening, um, like and Robert and I have done this before, be really gentle to yourself because yeah. this, we can see at least half of you are experiencing this. Um, so, and if you go into self-attack, that really won't help you, I don't think. It, and and this, is, this, this is the lesson that I certainly have learned mm-hmm. is, and you've mentioned this through this uh, broadcast, the finding that place that yeah. you're happy um, and yeah. finding that place that you're vital yeah. um, and learning how to communicate, yeah. I think is a, is a huge yeah. issue yeah. that, that people with MS and perhaps that is something that we should cover in this webinar series. Yeah. Yeah. And okay. We're, we're getting close to the, the okay. close. So kind um, of wrap up Jonathan. Okay. okay. Um, the, Isolation is, we've accepted, is a problem for people with MS. Okay. COVID makes it worse. Yeah. Um, but you're, you're saying to us that we need to find someone mm-hmm. or something that gives us back that uh, feeling of closeness again. Yes. Yeah. Um, and finding a person that you could talk to that sees you. Yes. Right? Yeah. And I actually think it's, you need to have somebody outside of your family. Mm -hmm. I think that makes it easier. Now, 
that's where I've been fortunate. Jonathan is my psychologist, so I get okay. to I get to offload on him mm. and and let him know my stuff. And I find that really useful. Now that could be a priest, it could be yep, a yep. very good friend. Yep. It doesn't necessarily have to be a psychologist, no. but somebody that you can talk to. Yeah, definitely. Um, now, I just want to tell you a little bit more about the upcoming webinars. The next one is in a month's time, so you can register early for that, and it's going to be about diet. I'll be speaking with Dr. Connor Curley about that, and we're going to go through things like uh, the autoimmune protocol diet. We're going to talk about supplements. We're talking about maybe time of eating the right foods and the wrong foods. Are there foods that... Uh, cause more inflammation. So like what you were saying there earlier, Jonathan, about the cortisol increasing and that extra inflammation in our bodies, yeah. is there something in diet maybe that we can do to help that? Oh, it's, it's the next, um, you know, it's like space research. This is the area where, where all mental health, all biologists and the basic scientists are going towards. It's this enteric system, this brain-gut axis. It, it, it's it's the new place, yeah. I think, and is the new way of treating illnesses yeah. uh, doing that. So thank you very much, Jonathan, for you, being with us today. The 45 minutes just literally, wow. boom, boom, flies by for me anyway. Um, just to let everybody know, this is recorded. So we're going to have it available on YouTube. It's also going to be available as a podcast. And there will be a transcription available of this and any sites or places that we mentioned in this talk will be available for people afterwards. So it'll be about a week or so before the video will be uploaded. So thank you very much. And uh, looking forward to uh, next month. And if anybody has any questions that you want to ask on diet about with Dr. Connor Curley, let us know. Or I'm sure, Jonathan, if there's some other questions, we might be able to go over them at another stage. Yeah, super. Thank you very much.